blood and ashes welcome to another episode of phantology podcast today we are reviewing the first book of the wheel of time saga the eye of the world by robert jordan but before we go too far let me mention if you like the content we're putting out join our discord look us up on social media at phantology books okay that said we are ready to get started and i have our dedicated Wheel of Time expert Jake on the line to break down all of the minutia of the series. He knows everything there is to know. What is up, Jake? How's it going, guys? I hope I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. Yeah, if you can't tell, we are very excited to get to this series. It's a series that is going to continue to see more and more of a renaissance in coming days as we get more details about the upcoming TV show. It looks like that show is going to drop in 2021 although they did just announce suspension of filming due to COVID-19. Hopefully that doesn't last too long. But I know you are really excited for the series, right, Jake? Yeah, super excited. This has been probably my favorite fantasy series since I was uh, in fifth or sixth grade. It was my mom's favorite series, and she tried forever to get us into it. And, and I'm so glad that she introduced it into my life. It's definitely one of my favorites. And as you can attest on our Discord or on the podcast, anytime people start to to rank the Wheel of Time lower than I think it should be, I'm quick to defend it and push it back up in those rankings. Yeah, so you actually read, started reading this series as a 10 to 11 year old is what you're telling me? Yeah. My mom, wow. there were times like when I was way younger, when my mom would like try to read it to us, she'd like gather us around like, oh, I want to tell you guys this story. You're like, mom, this is so boring. Like, let us... Let me read, uh, was it Space Brat? Was that a thing? Do you guys remember that? I don't remember Space Brat. Maybe you were going to go for like Aragon? No, I never, I didn't read Aragon until probably two years ago. Reading The Wheel of Time as young as I did kind of made me a stop, a snob when it came to books. So, <laughs> Yeah, I want to ask you about that a little more. But before we go too far, let's give our first time listeners, those who are maybe not familiar with the series, a little bit of a primer of what they can expect from the Wheel of Time. Obviously, people going into the series are probably going to know that it's 14 books, 4.4 million words in the entirety of the series. So, wow, that's one big detail. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely not for the faint of heart to, to finish this. And you'll quickly find that Robert Jordan is a flowery writer. He likes, he likes the repetition and the expanding of the prose. But beautiful prose, right? One of your favorites, one of my favorites. Yeah, I really like it. He's uh, he's not quite uh, Patrick Rothfuss for me, but I think he does a really good job of writing where I feel very immersed in the in the story and the descriptions are very poetic. Yeah, I think one of the strengths of the series for sure is the world that he builds and the connection you feel to the characters. The world is very large. If you look at the map, there are lots of different nations. And I think it's cool as you, as you go book by book, the characters are visiting different nations and you, and you get a really good sense of how detailed and well built out the world is to the point where I could probably look back and tell you what the difference between like a Domani and a Borderlander is. For example, they have very different customs, even to the point of how they look and how they dress. And those things might be hammered home um, maybe too many times, but I think it just adds to the, the world. And so if you are someone who really likes to get immersed into something and understand all of the details of a very impressive world, this is a series for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. His writing is a lot of the devils and the details kind of thing where, again, it's kind of his strength and his weakness. I really have learned to enjoy it over time where he'll repeat the different idiosyncrasies of each culture to the point where some people would think, okay, this is repetitive. I know these people do this. I know that already. But as someone who's read it over and over again, it's nice because you, you hear those key phrases, you know, okay, I'm over here in our demand, or okay, I'm in the borderlands, like you said, or I'm still in Andor. You can tell where people are from based off these little descriptions that can get repetitive, but they're a good way to, to key into the massive world that he's built out. I'm going to steal this from Daniel Green, but he just had a video come out talking about the negative things in Wheel of Time. And one thing he touched on was because of the detail, if you are a binge reader and you're going to go through this really quickly, 
that may be more grating on you, but if you're going to take your time and slowly make your way through it, it helps to be reminded of all those details, especially when we're talking about a huge map, a 14 book series, 4.4 million words, like I mentioned, that's fine to me to, to focus on the detail that much. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. I agree with pretty much everything he said in that video. Yeah, with those repetitions, I just finished binging um, the whole series, listening to it. And I don't know whether listening to it, it's easier to overlook those repetitions or harder. But I do think when it was the publications were being released, it was probably more necessary. You know, you have years in between each book. It's probably necessary to get that repetition to catch people back up and get them focused again on what's going on in the plot. But it's not, it's never like a last time on the wheel of time. It's nothing like that. It's just, it's more of a a nuanced and subtle repetition. Okay. And good news. We actually have Ben joining us and he just finished his first read of the entire series. Not all that long ago. He'll chime in uh, when, when he has something to add, but he's not quite the level of expertise that a Jake, for example, might, might be bringing to the table, right? Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I've actually read the first book twice. I read it once in high school, and I don't think I was ready for the commitment that Wheel Time is when I was in high school. And so I kind of put down the series and then picked it up back up um, later on in life. Understandable. And that's what a lot of people complain about on Goodreads, right? That commitment level, the, the pace, the slow pacing, the length of the series. A lot of folks, this is just not, that's not an appealing series uh, or type of series to read. So Jake, going back to kind of what you were talking about earlier, kind of alluded to this, but this first book especially is very similar to Lord of the Rings, to Tolkien, right? Yeah, I'd say that it's basically, um, and Robert Jordan is pretty open with this, his attempt to kind of pay homage to the whole Lord of the Rings and do his own take on it. And then I'd say probably halfway through the novel, it kind of starts to flip all those token um, uh, archetypes and tropes on their head and really starts to make it his own plot wise and world building, especially once you get to book four, that's when it really, the world building of its own kind of starts to take shape. But um, I'd say halfway through the eye of the world, you can really see how a lot of the tropes he set up to be similar to Tolkien start to kind of turn on their head and become their own thing. And let's start to kind of get into it. So we are going to do spoilers for this first book. And I thought what we'd do is just kind of take the book in chunks. So as the action begins, we have the Shire. Okay, so before we get into any spoilers, the basic premise of the book, again, is pretty similar to Tolkien. You have this group of five people from a village called the Two Rivers who get led away by this wise woman who is kind of the magician, the wizard, and they start off an adventure like that so right there it's pretty similar to lord of the rings right and it's kind of implied that one of the people will be like the savior some like and and kind of defeat the the big bad of the world right yeah there's this whole idea of the book um about this savior who's supposed to be reborn before the kind of end of the world thing happens and that person can either save or destroy the world and i guess one of the other themes worth mentioning is this idea of rebirth. The wheel of time itself refers to the machinations of time in this universe where everyone goes through what, Jake? Like a a rebirth of sorts? So Yeah, it's like a reincarnation. Everything is cyclical and everything is balanced. Those are two big themes of the wheel of time is the cyclical nature and repetition of everything and the... um, the balance of good and evil. So you'll have one soul that's born, lives a life, dies, and they'll be reborn in another age, living a completely different life and dying and so on and so on. It's this eternal, yeah, eternal reincarnation. But you're not necessarily aware of like your previous lives or anything. No, not at all. It's very, it's very similar to Eastern ideas of what reincarnation is. Um, There's not really a system of karma at all. But just the idea that you'll be born into a new life. You won't have memories of it, but you'll have another chance to live. Yeah, and one of the cool one of the cool things about this series is how he pulls from different Earth cultures for a lot of the different in-world cultures. 
And this is where you see a, this idea of rebirth, right? It's more of an Eastern mm -hmm. idea. And in each of the different cultures that he sets up, they all kind of have some themes and inhale. Uh, they call back to different earth cultures. And I know the uh, the TV show, one of the hot button things about the TV, TV show right now is the fact that the actors that have been cast are, are more mixed race than you might expect to see from a typical European fantasy. But actually in the in the book, race is not nearly as important as the difference in culture. Yeah, we had, we had talked earlier about how detailed Robert Jordan is with the intricacies of each culture. And, and he really hits that home. It's not so much the color of someone's skin or anything like that that really defines them or separates them from any other group. It's, it's their culture. They have the little habits of their, um, their societies. That's way more of a distinguishable feature and a discriminatory feature than, than race would be at all in this world. It takes place after a huge upheaval in society. They call it the breaking of the world, where all these civilizations collapsed and were rebuilt and collapsed again. And so there is a lot of moving around, um, groups of people intermingling. And so the idea of race isn't really a thing, but the different nations that came up, that's where people's identities really fall into. Yeah, so we're going on record and saying we are okay with changes the TV show has made up, such that we know about them to this point right? Yeah, to this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so before we actually do spoilers, let's do our customary content warning. This, there is not a lot in the series, right? And things that uh, content that does happen is off camera, for the most part, like there's some sexual content that you know that's happening, but there's never anything explicitly described. Any swears are all in world swears. So things like blood and ashes, there are some more odd swears that are not necessarily my favorite. And then violence, yeah, there, there's probably more violence. That'd be the majority of the content here, right? So from the series as a whole, I'd say lowest would be language because it really is in-world swears, kind of similar to how um, I'd say Star Wars was. And then next up would be sexual content. There are lots of instances where you know throughout the series people are naked or there's like sexual tension, you know, people have slept with each other, but there's no details into describing a naked body or any sexual acts or anything like that. So that's pretty tame. And then violence, I'd, I'd say most of it is off camera, but pretty gruesome things do happen. So it's not as uh, grimly described as you'd find in like Game of Thrones or First Law, but some pretty horrible things violently do happen. But for this book, I'd say pretty much everything is at a one out of 10 besides the violence. Violence maybe at like a three out of 10 in this one. There's like not much at all going on. Yeah. You were saying you read this book when you were 10 years old, right? And like people, you know, people die in combat someone gets stabbed, but yeah, nothing big, no descriptions, no gruesome details. So look, if you're looking to read a fantasy book series, this is about as tame as you're going to get in the adult fantasy category, right? Obviously, fantasy is kind of a weird misnomer <laughs> for the category, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure if you search adult fantasy, you'll find something else. Yeah, I remember uh, in one of Sanderson's lectures that we attended, he made a, a, a little joke about how he was writing adult fantasy, and that was not necessarily what people might think. Right. You know, even like outside of YA, like there's tons of YA books that I think are more violent than the Hunger Games is far more violent than than these books. Yeah, and, and I think the Hunger Games like focuses on the effects of that violence. I'd say the most violent as like the vo most violent parts of Wheel of Time, the most detailed violent parts are probably about um, as bad as Hunger Games, if not a little less. Before we get into spoilers, Jake, if I were to read the first book and enjoy it, would that be a good indication that I would enjoy the entire series? Or would I have to read longer to find out if I, if I would enjoy the entire series? You know, I, you might have to read a little longer. Um, I think the series kind of gets into its own in book four. I think that's really where it starts to expand and become its, its own unique thing. But I'd say if you enjoyed book one, you'll enjoy the rest of the series. If you didn't enjoy book one, I'd say read until book four, because then you'll get really get a sense for the identity there and what's going on forward. 
Okay. So if you didn't enjoy book one and you really don't want to like it, keep on reading until book four. Yeah. The book, book one, like we we're saying, it there's lots of these typical fantasy tropes that are in there. You know, they're kind of on a on a quest or on a journey to do something, lots of traveling, you know, just typical things like that. Whereas once you get later in the series, there's more, the world just gets a lot bigger. There's more politicking. The consequences of everyone's actions are very apparent and cause even more conflicts to arise. I'm going to disagree a little bit. I think if you didn't like the first book, you're probably not going to be a a big fan of the series. You're not certainly not going to be invested enough to read all 14. So if you read the first and don't like it, if you actively dislike it, we'll say. If you're on the fence about it, sure, read some more. But if you didn't like it, maybe pick up something else. This might not be for you. Man, yeah, I I disagree with that. I've seen so many posts people say once they've read book three or four, they're like, wow, like I didn't know this was going to happen. I didn't realize that this is the type of series it was. I'm so excited to move forward. I would say I'm going to kind of cut the difference between that. If you have read fantasy before Wheel of Time and know you like the genre of fantasy, then maybe keep on reading, like maybe maybe persevere, because then it kind of might harken back to some of the other fantasy books that you enjoy. But like if this is your first exposure to fantasy and you didn't like book one and you keep on reading, you might not enjoy the rest and then might turn you off of fantasy. It really depends on why you didn't like it. If you don't like it for the um, just fantasy in general, yeah, this is a pretty heavy fantasy book pretty like in-depth world and so if that isn't the kind of thing you're gonna like then yeah it's not for you but if you don't like it for if you're a typical fan of fantasy but weren't a fan of the first book i'd say give it some more time and see how it grows okay so leading into our story book one the eye of the world the characters start in the shire i mean the two rivers right (laughs) yeah they're about to celebrate this festival stop me when this sounds like something you've heard before And a wizard comes into the town and says, hey, we need you young people here. There's something special about you. Come on this adventure with me. Orcs attack? Mm, Trollocs? Trollocs. Trollocs, yeah. (laughs) I mean, they're orcs, right? They're bestial creatures. And we go off with Moraine, I mean Gandalf. And from there, things change a bit. But this beginning is totally Lord of the Rings, right? It's just so similar. There's hardly any separation. Right. And doesn't, doesn't Matt even do something with fireworks? Is that a thing? There's going to be fireworks at the party, and he's trying to get his hand on some, but we don't get any some Merry and Pippin shenanigans quite. <laughs> okay, but still, it's definitely a reference, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's meant to be very similar. And one thing, or a couple things he does to um, kind of make it his own is the w- the wizard character moraine is a woman because um something that's unique to the wheel of time is in this series men and women can both use magic be magic users but in this series if men use it they go insane and so they're kind of cold out of the population if if a man is found to be able to use the one power is what they call it um be able to channel the one power then they are found and that ability is either removed from them or they're killed. So all the magic users that society looks up to and that can do these great wonders and are these leaders in the world are all women. And that's why the wizard is Moraine, a woman. And this affects the whole, the whole gender dynamics of the world. You don't see it as much in this book, but throughout the series, you see that women have a much bigger role in society, um, especially when it comes to leading and are taken more seriously. And there's kind of this role reversal where men are kind of seen as untrustworthy because of the inherent, that that inherent lack of being able to use the magic without going insane and killing and destroying. Yeah, that for sure is a little, he was a little ahead of his time, perhaps. This first book was published in 90. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know if he went into the series thinking he wanted to write a a series that was more pro-women or if just the way the story came about when he was developing it, it was just the the natural step to it. There's a reason why men go crazy when they use the power. Um, I won't go into now. I don't want to get in too much into the details, but, but I really don't know if this was like a conscious effort or if it just developed to be. But yeah. So if you, if you have some pro feminist views, I think you'll, you'll like this aspect of the book. Yeah. I would say it's progressive in several ways. 
Although let me push back on the woman a little bit because one of the criticisms of the series are the actual female characters are often very obnoxious to the point where people make jokes about, you know, oh, maybe if you meet Robert Jordan's wife, you'll realize where all of these obnoxious <laughs> things are coming from because they're they're kind of shrew-like almost at, at times and they don't always come off in the most likable ways. I agree with you there. Two counterpoints. One, there's only really two or three characters, main characters that are women that do that. And there are plenty of women characters who aren't that way. Moraine isn't. Swan isn't. Varen isn't. There's a lot that aren't. But along the lines with the women who are obnoxious, I don't know. Again, I don't know if this was his intent or not, but it kind of goes along with the lines of this whole reversal of instead of the patriarchy, you have the matriarchy. So all the times the women are being obnoxious and dismissing the men's ideas or being obstinate towards them, it could be seen as kind of a discussion of how men do that to women today. And so he reversed it and had women do that to men since the women were the more dominant gender in the books. So I agree with this, like in terms of the series as a whole, but like in terms of the first book and how it affects like the two rivers, it's kind of interesting, right? Because like you have the woman's circle but then you like, which is like the matriarch group. But then you also have the mayor or whatever the town council, right? And they're like the ones that I'm putting like I'm doing quotation marks with my fingers, but like they make the decisions. But like the women's circle are kind of like the the real force behind those decisions. So I don't know. It's kind of he, he kind of holds a mirror up to society and says, okay, like I'm still gonna show how the real world works. But then also the power, the one power kind of changes that dynamic a little bit. So it's kind of interesting in that regard. Yeah, you're right. It's not a complete role reversal. It's kind of this blend of upheaval of societal norms. So I guess it depends how far you into it you want to read, but there is certainly yeah. some social commentary here. This all got started talking about the differences that he makes between this archetype that he took from Lord of the Rings. Um, in Lord of the Rings, they go off with Gandalf in quotations, they go off with Gandalf on this journey, fully trusting in Gandalf. He's this trustworthy, wise person that everybody knows, okay, he's a good guy. He's, he has the best interest in heart. He's the safest place. But when our characters start their journey, Moraine is this huge unknown. She's kind of untrustworthy for being a magic user. She belongs to a society that's known to use people for their own their own causes for good or bad of the people they're using. As the series starts, they're with this this mage, this this magic user, but they aren't sure how far they can trust her. They aren't sure whether she has their best interests at heart, really, or if they're just part of some plot of hers, but they're kind of stuck in this, uh, we have nothing else to do because if we stay, we're going to die. So we have to go with her. But that's another kind of twist on the whole Tolkien, Tolkien start there. Yeah, Gandalf is certainly mysterious, but you always kind of get the sense that he's probably doing the best for the sweet little hobbits. But with Moraine, you really don't know, right? She could yeah. be she could, she could be out for to purely her own interest. She could be Red Aja. She could be part of you know. She could be a dark friend even. Yeah. So if we think about like the specific characters, what what character? I, I'm forgetting like legitimately. What character doesn't trust her? Is it Matt? Is kind of like, oh, that I said I can't trust them. None of them really do. Tom is very wary of her. Nynaeve dislikes her because she's trying to protect her two rivers folk. Egwene is really the only one who is like, this is awesome. We're going on an adventure. I'm going to learn to be an I said I. And then Perrin is more reserved. Egwene is totally besotted with her and it starts to use magic. And Moraine is like her hero. I'd say Matt's probably the most vocal about his distrust in the whole Aes Sedai thing, besides besides Nynaeve. But Nynaeve doesn't really care about her being an Aes Sedai as much as... Based on, on principle. Yeah, like you're coming into my town. and, and... Yeah. So, Jake, would you have liked this series as much as you currently do if it hadn't been one of your first entries into fantasy? And what I'm trying to kind of get at here is the fact that popular fantasy books that are coming out now, like your Sanderson's and Joe Abercrombie, etc., do a lot to subvert more uh, classical tropes. 
So they still have things in there that harken back to early fantasy days, but then they twist everything on their heads. But this series doesn't hardly do that at all, right? Like it, it has the tropes in there and it kind of sticks with them and maybe it's got its own flavor to it, but it's pretty much your your classic like sword and scroll, sword and shield adventure, right? Or, or would you disagree? I, I disagree with that. I'd say by today's standards, it definitely follows the more traditional fantasy plot lines for the first few books but really the series as a whole does not it's it's very you it's very different in the way it does everything the first book is very much like lord of the rings like we said but after that it starts to really become its own and i'd say for its time the reason it got so popular is because it was sub- subverting all of the typical fantasy stuff sanderson has mentioned this a lot there were so many authors who were just repeating the Lord of the Rings type story, the very kind of Dungeons and Dragon-y quests and Chosen One plot lines, things like that. And then Robert Jordan came along and started it kind of that way and then really subverted it. For the time, I feel like it was a huge subversion and that's why he got so many fans that way. And I'd say, honestly, by the end of book one, it's very different from the way Lord of the Rings is going. Things have greatly changed and plot structure and everything like that. I had read Lord of the Rings before I started reading this. And to be honest, at the time, I just assumed all fantasy started this way kind of thing. That's just how fantasy was. A lot of people have problems with the Sword of Truth series. And when I read that, I was also inexperienced with my reading. And so I just thought, oh, this is just what fantasy does, not realizing how many tropes and like cliches are in that book. Man, you were a you were a very well read ten year old kid. Lord of the Rings and Wheel of Time, and I didn't read the Sword of Truth until until probably I was like fourteen. But Lord of the Rings, I read that because the movies were coming out, and so I was like, I got to read these. To be honest, I probably did not get prob- like forty percent out of what was in there, but I was familiar with the plot line, you know. So, did you have any friends when you were younger? Just books all the time. I'm picturing like Sheldon. <laughs> I was grounded a lot, and all you could do is read when you're grounded, so, in my family. <laughs> I will say that Jake actually bullied me when I was younger, so I kind of have scars from that. He kicked me off my seat at the lunch table. when He, he channeled his 9 ears there and then pushed you around. It's the truth. I had to sit on Jake's trumpet case. Made up st- my trumpet case? I didn't even play trumpet. Anyway, so, yeah, I would, I would disagree with you there. That's By today's standards, when you look at things like the Stormlight Archive and game of thrones things like that they're so different from the standard lord of the rings story that they really stand out and this one's going to seem way more similar to lord of the rings but i put up put out the disclaimer that that doesn't stick around for very long so that sounds like a good response to folks on goodreads who are saying man i couldn't get through the first book it's just lord of the rings but even longer and slower so that's where you would say, hey, stick around and read three or four books here and see if you like where it goes. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of take this as Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time is somewhat of a foundational building block for fantasy. Like you have the base of fantasy being Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. And then from there, there were some more things. But I think Wheel of Time is a, is a huge building block that has sprung up a lot of more present day authors and obviously sanderson is one of he'll probably go down as another building block that takes fantasy into the future but he stands upon the shoulders of robert jordan he even finished the series yeah i'd say as much as robert jordan stands on the shoulders of tolkien i'd say most modern writers kind of stand on his shoulders when it comes to world building and the intricacies of the plots so in that sense hey if you want to be serious about reading fantasy books you have to read Wheel of Time. It's foundational. Yeah, I'd say it's foundational. It's a staple. I understand there are a lot of books to it, but it really is so game-changing. Okay, so Jake, take us through, after our heroes leave the two rivers, take us through what happens next. So you get the typical stop in a few towns on their way, kind of their first, oh, wow, this is a first city I see, even though it's just a, a smaller town than most people consider it a smaller town. And then you get to a point where the kind of pivotal point in a plot where the characters get separated. And I'd say this is here 
the beginning of where you see kind of the the plot stray away from the Lord of the Rings general plot. You get to find out some pretty cool things about each character. Perrin can talk to wolves in his mind. You get to know the world a little more. You you meet the tinkers. Yeah, so they get separated in the mysterious city, right? Somewhat of a of a fantasy staple, but this cursed city remnants of 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 some past evil that you know is obviously very serious, but but don't really um, know how insidious, how quite insidious it is until they get there. And Matt, who's one of our heroes, goes in, picks up the cursed dagger. The whole time you're telling him, no, don't do it, don't do it. And of course he does. And he is struck down with some kind of unknown sickness. He starts to go a little bit crazy. And he's obviously turning evil unexpectedly against his his real nature. And that's not resolved in the first book. So we don't want to do too many spoilers there. But uh, mm-hmm. but that scene in Shatter Logoth is one of the more memorable in the first book for me. Yeah, same. Um, I feel like that, like you said, that is like a, a fantasy trope. I can't think of where else that comes from but it is that standard kind of haunted cursed city where everything in it is cursed don't touch anything kind of idea yeah it's like a you know aladdin the the cave of wonders yeah yeah i don't know i i it's like making me think of something that's on the tip of my tongue i i don't know what it is so you see it in in the lycanius trilogy as well yeah yeah i got major shadar logoth vibes from uh from that city yeah and that's a I mean, I would say, again, he's just building off, James Islington there is building off of the eye of the world. Same idea. So, and and the whole, as the story goes on, you know, one of these three boys, the main characters, are special in some way. You assume one of them could be this chosen one savior. And I think the first, probably the first third of the book does a good job kind of holding in that mystery. Who could it be? I mean, it's primarily told through the perspective of Rand. So there's that implicit bias for figuring out who it could be. But you see that Matt has a strong connection with his past lives. He can speak the old tongue and has these like memories coming back. And then Perrin can talk to wolves. Another thing that is said to be really ancient, a new ability, an old ability coming again kind of thing. But you always kind of know that Rand is really the special, right? Like you say, the action starts with him. He's the main viewpoint for the majority of this book. And if it was, if it turned out to be the case that Rand was not the Dragon Reborn, or at least that's what they think at the end of the first book, that would be really shocking to me. In fact, I'd like to read a book. Maybe people on Discord suggest a book to me where the main viewpoint character that you think is going to be the the special savior type character is actually not and it's like the sidekick best friend who steps in that would be cool yeah i've seen i've seen that done really well once i hesitate to say where i what movie i saw it in for for spoilers for that movie but that that is something that would be really hard to pull off and when it's done well it's it's amazing i think like one more kind of trope that you fall into was that there's like this mystery mystery around Rand's birth as well right so that's yeah. an indicator that he's kind of the dragon reborn as well is the is the idea of what are they called when you're like the pattern weaves itself around you to varin to varin right that's introduced in the first book right got more ink kind of hints at that concept yeah that's a huge a huge plot device that is like a way to cover up the whole idea of plot armor in books where nothing bad can happen to these main characters because they're the main characters well and the Wheel of Time, it's like part of the mythos. Nothing bad can happen because the Wheel of Time is weaving it that way. <laughs> I never got the sense that nothing bad could happen to them because there is a force opposing what they are trying to do. Yeah. There are the dark friends who come pretty close to taking out some of the characters in this book. And you do see one of the characters doesn't make it, right? Yeah, so so Tom in Whitebridge gets taken out by uh, one of the Fades. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, again, it's it gives them that plot armor to have the plot of the books revolve around them because the wheel is weaving the age lace around them. But like you said, you have the opposite force. The Dark One's trying to destroy the wheel completely, i.e. destroy time and reality. So it doesn't really matter what's being woven into reality if, you know, you destroy it. So there's still that that looming threat, like you said. And in later books, you get more of a inside look into the Dark One and and the forsaken 
But in this book, you just kind of get them towards the very end. So catch us up through a, a little more, a few more of these events. So eventually they they go through, they're separated, they meet back up again in Camelin, which is the capital of the country that they're from, and they have a run-in with some royalty. And what happens at that point? Because that's kind of where the actual importance of the plot takes off, right? Yeah, that's when, based off of the travels that Perrin had with the Tinkers, hearing about the Aiel, warning them about Sightblinder trying to slay the Great Serpent, which is, again, referencing destroying reality and time. Um, and then Loyal, the Ogier, that you get to meet. Also, we'll have to go into bigger detail on the Loyal and Ogier in general. But he also has heard that from his Ogier people as well. And so Moraine realizes, shoot, we got to go to the eye of the world right now to prevent this from happening. So really, you don't get like the first probably two thirds of the book, they're wandering around kind of aimlessly. And it isn't until that point where the third of the book left where it's like, okay, this is where we're going now. Like, and we have a reason for it other than just running away. And Moraine doesn't even know her plan is what to just take them back to the White Tower initially, right? Right. Yeah. And for safekeeping. It's very vague. So luckily, plot comes along and pushes events that are going to really kick off the entirety of the series. Yeah. Interesting that that doesn't really happen until, like you say, two thirds of the way into the book. And honestly, after rereading this, this last read through, book one is really just an introduction to the series. He definitely, Robert Jordan definitely had a lot of the major points for the plots that happened throughout the 14 books planned out and knew what needed to happen along the way. But there are some things I feel like in this book that things about the world that weren't quite hammered out and how he wanted to do it. Um, I feel like in later books, things start to solidify and fall in place more. And this one seems almost like just an introduction to the characters and get the plot kicked off. But he always kind of knew where he was going, right? You, you get a sense that it was fairly well planned out. I know that, again, going back to one of Sanderson's lectures, which I like to reference, Sanderson says there are two different ways to plot out an epic fantasy book. One is his way, which is go into the minutia and the details in, an, in a very, very drawn out outline. And the other way is the Robert Jordan way of saying points on a map. So Robert Jordan knew okay, I need the characters to go here and do this thing, but I'm not really sure exactly what's going to happen. And so once they get to the city, then maybe some things happen. And then that leads us to our next thing. But all of the in-betweens and really the, uh, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is he just had the broad strokes. He had a lot, like he had pretty much every major, major thing plotted out. There are prophecies that are mentioned in book one that reference things that don't happen until like books seven, eight, nine, ten, and onward, and especially the, the last book, book 14. So he definitely had a lot of the, the main plot elements planned out. He, it wasn't going in this with no direction at all. I just think he kind of had a tone shift starting into book two and three into the world. Not, not so much the plotting, but just how things work. Like the tone of the world and everything seemed to change after that. I think my favorite prophecy or thing that was that was foreshadowed was one of men's viewings about Matt has him weighing the fate of the world into scales and he puts his eye on the scale and that balances yeah. the scale. You don't know what that is until second to last book. And yeah. that's one of my favorite parts in the entire series. And he's got that going in the first book. So when I finally got to that in book 13, awesome. V huge payoff. Yeah, yeah. There's things even in the prologue with with Ashamael and Luce there and there, like things are hinted at that you'd think, oh, this is just a generic like evil guy in the prologue. And then you realize later on, oh, this is what he was talking about. This is these are the ramifications of that. So yeah, I think he had a lot of it planned out. And the series is so good because of that. Going back to kind of the point of the eye of the world, this book. Honestly, the first few times I read it, I didn't think much about like what is the purpose of this adventure they're on. But it was this past time reading it, I realized so jumping forward in the plot, they get to the eye of the world, which is this location um, guarded by the green man, which is the last of these constructs from the age of legends that are made of, it's this man made of plants. Pretty cool idea. I just kind of think of him as the jolly green giant. Yeah, basically. Jolly green giant. Yeah. He's awesome. 
uh, Someshta, I think his name is, but uh, they get there and he's guarding what are two pools of Sidene and Sidar, and also has the dragon banner and the horn of Valir. And I think in my initial read throughs, I'm like, oh, okay, that's the point of it was to get the the horn of Valir. But really, I think the important part is, like we said, you find out here that Rand can channel and that he's assumed to be the dragon reborn because he has the dragon banner there. But I think the important part is he's able to channel so much at this time of pure Sidene that isn't tainted because I of the world was created before the taint. And I don't think I really realized that the first few times I read this, but this last time I was just like, what is the point of this? Why are they doing this? And I realized, oh, this is a way for him to channel a bunch. And when men channel, their strength isn't determined right away. They kind of have these bursts of growth. And so this was a way for him to grow a ton in his strength and channeling with pure untainted sighting, which is, I, I don't think they hammer home the, how important that was. And maybe I'm reading into it too much. No, you're, you're right. And definitely the ending is a little vague. And I feel like you don't get the, the importance and the ramifications of what's going on until later in the series, or maybe requiring another read through of what's going on here. Because it is quite abrupt, where all of a sudden they well first they're in Camelin and then they have to run and then they're going through the ways and then they're into Shinar right and then from there off to the next place so they're just kind of bam 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 going across the map and it's just very rapid fire it's a little hard to maybe keep up with and understand quite the the reason for everything that's going on and I'd say honestly the climax of this book was really exciting but it's really confusing. Every time I read it, I'm like, wait, am I just getting too excited? I'm reading too fast? Or is this just confusing? And I think it's just a confusing, the way things happen is just confusing. Rand's in one spot, and then he's in another spot, and then he's channeling, and then there's these cords connecting the dark one to something, and you're not sure what's going on. Like, it's just all this stuff is happening, and it's really confusing. What's the name of the pass that he teleports to where the Trollocs are, are coming through? Tarwin's Gap. Tarwin's Gap. That's what it is. Tarwin's Gap. Yeah, Tarwin's Gap. So that was kind of the climax for me. I know there's the part with the Dark One as well. Well, that's it's all happening kind of at the same time because he he's like appearing in different places. Then he appears at Tarwin's Gap and is able to clear out all these trollic. And he hears the voice of the creator. Yeah, and that that's kind of what I was referencing where that happens in book one and then never happens again until maybe in the last book, depending on how you read into things. But I feel like that was one of the things where he did this in book one and then realized, wait, I don't think I really want that to be a thing anymore. And so it just never happens again. It did kind of seem like that because it's interesting how the Dark One is such a force throughout the series, but the creator, the you know, the the opposite, the yin to the Dark One's yang is not present at all, right? He prefers to act through intermediaries such as the Dragon Reborn. Yeah, very laissez-faire approach to to gardening your your creations. I'd also say another thing I, I think falls in line with the kind of tone change. The first book is pretty cheesy. There's like some pretty cheesy parts and dialogue and the whole sense of wonder of them discovering the world can kind of come off cheesy. And I feel like that drops off pretty hard around there's still a little bit in book two but i feel like by the end of book two and three that kind of tone of this like cheesy fantasy adventure is gone yeah you definitely get a sense for the characters maturing the characters change quite a bit from book one to book 14 yeah so one question i had at the end of at the end of book one is if rand killed the dark one and which you're led to believe at the end of book one where does the series go from there and I actually had that question for a long time because remember, I, I read book one and then didn't pick up the series for probably a decade. And so, you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, there's 14 or 13 books after this. Like, what happens? So perhaps you thought the whole series is over after book one? <laughs> right. Like the rest <laughs> of them, it's just like celebration that Rand killed the Dark One. <laughs> yeah, that would be a boring series. I, I can understand people saying the series is boring with 13 books of celebration. <laughs> yeah, this is another, this is a good example of kind of the devils in the details with his writings because... Prophecies are mentioned and little bits of information are dropped along the way throughout the first book to let you kind of figure out what really happened at the end in terms of uh, did he just slay the dark one? 
it kind of ends ambiguously, but there's there's things that are mentioned that can give you clues to to what's what's in store later in the series. And my impression was Rand is cheering and telling everyone, you know, hey, I killed the Dark One, we're all good to go. And Moraine just kind of like walks away, SMH Rand, you're an idiot. Yeah, you got so much to learn, sheep herder. <laughs> right. <laughs> Stupid wool headed sheep herder. <laughs> so we didn't talk about this specifically, but one of my favorite parts about the series are the characters. With 14 books, you really have time to connect to characters, and they're all really well fleshed out. How does Robert Jordan create such strong characters? What is it that he does to make them so real? Yeah, I'm. Not, that's a good question. It's hard for me to think about this just in terms of the eye of the world, because the characters I know from The Wheel of Time, I know them so well from spanning multi, like so many books. So for me, the thing that makes them feel so real is just how dynamic they are and how much change they go through and how they, maybe it's just how they react to each situation. I feel like every character reacts in such a realistic way. And he writes the characters so well that I feel like I know them and I know how they react. Like if you present me with a a hypothetical conundrum that they're in, I'd know how each character would react. He writes them so well that I just know them so well. Going back to what I said about the points on the map style of writing, I think that's where the characters really shine because the plot is not driving the plot around. If you know what I mean, it's not like, oh, they're doing something and all of a sudden here comes the plot. So we got to go do the other thing. It's more like they're doing something and the characters are then making decisions based off of who they are. And sure, there's things that come in and obviously have to drive the story around, but the characters, the ones reacting, not necessarily the author in order to write the book. Right. Jake, I would kind of push back against your like reasoning behind the characters. That's actually one thing that I had a hard time with the series as I felt the like the characters were pretty static. Like I feel like Matt is always the lovable goofball. I feel like Perrin is always the somber person that kind of acts with his heart more than his head. And I feel like they don't really break out of those tropes. And granted, you can tell what they're going to do because of those strong personality traits. And they... But they just don't really grow past that, in my opinion. Ben, this is a way yeah. bad take. This is a way bad take you've come Terrible up with. Terrible take. Terrible you know, take. I, I'm going to stand by my take because I honestly felt like that was the whole series. And definitely the first book. Here's my... Let me respond first, yeah, Jake, and then you can come with your longer response. I don't know you have prepared. I'll take a breather. <laughs> so I agree that they are somewhat similar to, to their core. Like you said, maybe they don't develop past that. But isn't that what being a person is? Like you have who you are at your core. I'm always going to be somewhat of the same person. But through the years, I mature and in some of my rougher edges, hopefully um, get polished out a bit and I can grow as a person, but I can still come back to who I am, what kind of person I am at the core uh, of my being. And I think that's what you see with Matt and Perrin and Rand. But then you see them advance and, and grow and then mature in some surprising ways. That's my take. Okay, I, I agree with that. I agree that we all have an essence, but I don't think that our essences are boiled down to such tropey things. Realistically, I'm referring to Perrin and Matt here because I feel like they just have these personalities that are very kind of cookie cutter. And, and so those two characters in my mind don't really ever grow past that. I agree that we all have essences that we go back to. <clears throat> okay, Jake, your time. Take it away. <laughs> okay, first of all, I'll, I'll address Matt first. Matt's kind of identity is the fact that he doesn't let the rest of the world affect him so much. That like becomes his identity. So his personality growth isn't nearly as apparent as parents or especially Rand's. Rand has the, the probably the biggest growth ups and downs throughout the whole series. Um, but Parent has huge growth as well. But so starting with Matt, I mean, there's a huge difference between him and beginning of book one to the end of book one due to the circumstances he's in with the dagger and moving forward with the series he has another huge change in book three and then every every book after that this again kind of like incorporating what you said Stephen. people have like a kernel to them that's their identity and that kind of determines how they react to situations and then they kind of gain layers to that kernel based on how like the situations and how they've reacted to them so kind of a theme for Matt is he his outside persona stays the same throughout, but you can really see changes in his heart throughout the whole series. And I don't want to go into spoilers because we're only doing book one right now. 
But this is another good reason for doing rereads with the series. I know you're like, I just finished 14 books. Why do I want to do a reread? If you look at Matt's character, aside from the, the character change that happens with the new author, but if you look at where Matt's character's at at the end of book 14, compared to where Matt's at at the end of book one, it's a huge change. And you can do that with pretty much any character. And addressing Perrin with thinking with his heart, again, that is his kernel, but I mean, his his uh, encounter with the white cloaks and the wolves kind of defines his struggle throughout the series. Is he going to give in to his base primal instincts and rage, or is he going to maintain the level headedness that he was raised with this methodical, very thought out type of personality as the blacksmith. And there's plenty of points in the series where he's pushed to his limits on either side and he has to make his own kind of make his own compromises with himself and his values. And then Rand, Rand is like all over the place. I'm serious. He's like, book one, Rand is such a baby compared to end of book two, Rand compared, like every book, he just changes so much. So that was a very, very hard (laughs) disagree. (laughs) Ben, any, any quick, quick response if you have one. You know, maybe you're right. And maybe it's because I, like basically binge read these and i think anytime you do that you kind of sacrifice some of the love of characters in favor of the plot so i still think that the reason you're able to predict what how characters will react to certain things is because they have a pretty monotone personality and sure events happen that that change that 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 can make allow them to grow as a person but i don't know i maintain my my hot take there all right agree to disagree discuss more with us on the discord let me point out that Ben has known these characters for, what, a year? Well, Jake, <laughs> Jake has been friends with them for, uh, let's not give away how old Jake is. <laughs> years, right? Right. So you, you've loved these books for years. And kind of same with me. I read them not too much longer after, after you did. So I think the fact that we've carried them with us so, so far and through our growing up years has really probably created a stronger bond. Yeah, and I'd say it's kind of a testament to how good his writing is that that's your take then because the, the natural progression of how they change, in my opinion, is so, it's so natural. I said natural progression, but it's very like, you just take it without thinking about it. I remember talking to the about the series with my mom when I think just book like eight had just gone out. And I remember thinking like, man, I love Perrin. He's such a cool guy. And my mom was like, I just love like, how dynamic Rand is as a character. And I was like, what? Rand hasn't changed. But then doing a read through a reread, I realized, wait, Rand has changed a ton. So it's such gradual changes that I think it can be hard to miss. And it's really necessary to do those rereads to really get, really appreciate the changes that happen there. Yeah, I could agree with that. I never carried these books around in my backpack. You know what I mean? Like that. So I feel like, I feel like when you do that, you kind of gain a love for them. You know, I feel like that's the reason why so many people of our generation love Harry Potter so much is because you grew up, grew up with these characters. And that didn't really happen for me. You know, like Harry's not an amazing character, but like people like die on that hill all day long because because they grew up with him. So uh, get on the Discord and destroy Ben's argument for me, <laughs> please. <laughs> or, or observe the argument continuing in Discord chat. <laughs> Yeah, if you're on Discord, you know that. And like, if you if you insult anything about Wheel of Time, then then you're going to be ostracized. So I'm, I'm putting myself out there. Okay, so let's do a a new segment here. Let's do power rankings, top three and bottom three of characters. And I like this idea for Wheel of Time because as we go through the books, the characters have different moments. They have different times to shine depending on which book it is. So depending on which book. Certain books are very strong for some characters. Some characters don't even really appear in books. So, Jake, give us your top three characters in terms of, I don't know, whatever criteria you want to do, basically how awesome right. they were. Um, I'd say number one is Baselman. He's the you know the main antagonist throughout the, the whole series. He's getting into their dreams. He's making things that happen in their dreams, like have repercussions in, in reality with the rats and and the the bites and stuff. And then, you know, obviously the final battle there. Um, and then I'd have to go Moraine second, just because she's this ominous, just like this powerful figure. You don't know like how strong she is. And anytime things go bad, you know, everyone's relying on her. And then for a third, I feel like there are a lot that kind of 
compete for this, but I have to say Rand just because of how how powerful he is in the last in the climax of that when he's channeling full force and just demolishing Trollocs with the power and going toe to toe with Baselmon. Probably close close uh, honorable mentions would be Lan, really cool warrior, and then Patton Fane. I think he's he's up there with just his chaotic insanity. <laughs> He's just so unpredictable and creepy. Yeah, we'll have to do an, an alignment chart to describe all the characters. Pet and Fame is, is the chaotic evil force, yeah. but the, definitely every one of the nine <laughs> slots in your alignment chart is filled in the series. Ben, do you have a top three power ranking? I mean, I feel like mine's probably pretty similar. The first person that came to my mind was Moraine because like very early on in the book, you kind of feel like she has unlimited power. I, I'm thinking of a few scenes where she kind of gets them out of situations that they're they thought that they're gonna just like be demolished in, and she kind of waves her hand and and it's fixed. And so I f- feel like early on in the in the book, you feel like she's like the most powerful person ever. I also think that Tom, with his quick wittedness and and knowledge of the world and culture, not not in terms of like raw power, but in terms of his ability to handle situations, is pretty far up there. And then I actually feel like Tam who's Rand's father is kind of this hidden person that you think could like have much of the answers that you're that you're waiting to find throughout the series okay Tam Althor last seen in a cot in the midst of a fever dream makes the top three interesting (laughs) (laughs) you know what I'm not gonna do a top three if you're gonna insult them Steven (laughs) it's what this podcast is about insulting each other okay my top three Pretty similar. I'm going to go one, Randall Thor. It's his book. He's the main character. He's doing the cool stuff at the end. Number two, Moraine, because she is quite cool. And number three, tough. I'm going to go Egwene just to uh, just to be a little different. She's got some nice moments kind of opening up as a character, and she's one of my favorites throughout the series. So, yeah, that, those are my top three, Egwene. And, and maybe Pat on Fane. We, we should mention him as well. He mm-hmm. has a very interesting role to play throughout the series. He's kind of the Gollum-esque character throughout. He's like if you took Gollum but made Gollum a threat, like a, a legitimate threat. Right, like if Gollum could stab you in the back. He, it's, it's really interesting. You kinda, it kind of talks about it a little bit at the end of book one, just how he's influenced by the dark one but he also has been taken over by the evil of shadar logoth which is like this polar opposite evil so he's just this thrall to everything that is evil and i think that's another thing that i did not completely understand in my first read through the connection that he forged with the mashadar in shadar logoth yeah and you you'll learn more about that as as the series goes on more honorable mentions. I just remembered uh, what the green man does to defend his home. Like that was pretty cool. He just basically plantified one of the forsaken. Yeah. Was that Agnar or Belthamel? Honestly, they serve the same purpose. So no idea. <laughs> oh, come on. I thought you were our wheel of time expert. <laughs> no, I can't remember out of those two, which I think I'd have to look it up. I think Bethamel was the one that was more... Um, was like super old and had to wear the mask because he was so close to the boar. Right, he couldn't even speak. Yeah, but uh, honestly, no idea. You know, yeah, that probably makes sense because Agonor was the one who created the Trollocs, so he was probably the one that was torturing people more, um, so he could probably talk. Egwene and Nynaeve get some torture done on them by the Forsaken a little bit. Okay, so speaking of the Forsaken, let's also do a bottom three <laughs> lamest characters or characters who just did not have enough time to shine in the book. So for me, my bottom three, the number one pair of bottom characters are those two forsaken Agnar and the Thommel, I believe is how Jake pronounced it there. So I'm going with that. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> Something like that. These guys, these are forsaken servants of the shadow servants of the most evil force in the universe. And they come in and they talk and they act like they're all big bads. And they get taken out so quickly. I mean, how many pages are they even on in in the book for? Like 10, 20 pages and they're dead? Ah, I was disappointed in their performance. (laughs) 10, 20 pages and Robert Jordan's like two or three. And like Brandon Sanderson. So because of how flowery he gets. 
you are going to see more Forsaken, and the Forsaken, the other Forsaken are much better. So these guys are number one in my bottom three. Other bottom characters, Matt was bottom here just because of his performance. I mean, he picks up the dagger, very poor decision making, and then is controlled by it the rest of the book. Yeah, nerfs him so hard. <laughs> yeah, so he's going to get better. Readers, trust me, he's going to get better. But yeah, so I guess my bottom rankings are based off of like how stupid or poorly performing you were. And then also, I'm going to add in Nynaeve just because she was kind of annoying with how distrustful she was of Moraine. And it, she was just obnoxious. She's always in the way. Didn't really do anything too cool. Nynaeve, those are my, those are my bottom three. Okay, I'd say... I'd agree with, with the Forsaken and Matt for sure. Oh, one thing I forgot. Take out take out Rand. Number one spot for top three is Bella. She is top tier, most powerful character. Yeah, there's a fan theory that Bella is the creator, right? <laughs> yeah, you'll learn more about Bella as the as the series goes on. Um no, yeah, I'd say I'd say the Forsaken and Matt. Matt not so much for his poor decision making is just he was just nerfed so hard with the dagger he served no purpose except to like complain and be a hindrance to the plot and then i don't know i want to say loyal even though i love loyal he just doesn't do much other than get them through the ways which i got i guess was pretty pivotal but um yeah i i i put tam on the bottom 3 he didn't do much ooh <laughs> Jake, you just love insulting everything that's good and decent in the world, don't you? All right, Ben, <laughs> respond with your bottom three. You know, I think by nature of the bottom three, I don't even remember them in this book because it's been so long. That's a good point. I don't know. Gosh, yeah, I got nothing. Maybe uh, maybe some members of House Tricant. Is it Tricant? Is that how you say it? They're just kind of boring. They're, they get introduced but don't do too much. Aram, the Tinker Aram. I'm going to say Child Buyer. You know what? I will, I will amend that. I would say Loghain. You're exposed to like this terrible Dragon Reborn person in the first book, and he's just kind of marched through the city, and I'm like, oh, if this guy was really like this pure essence of evil, then he should be able to not just be able to be marched through a city. Yeah, I can get behind that. I think I was hoping for more. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to be evil, though. He, and plus, he was, he was shielded by, what, at least four sisters? Fair enough, but I feel like he's mentioned throughout this book as like, the world is like terrified and, and shook by this dragon reborn person that claims to be the dragon reborn. And then the only reason that they even see him is the plot device to get Rand to meet Elaine for the first time. I can see that a little bit. And I think the TV show has kind of jumped at this because rumors are that Logan's role will be expanded in the show. And I like that quite a bit. I think by the end of the series, Logan, Logan gets really cool, you know, and, and just not, not that way in the first book. Nothing but good things. By expanding but his to role. Be clear, Tam is definitely top three powerful. <laughs> All right, so the power rankings are going to replace the worst of the best segment for our Wheel of Time content. So no worst of the best, you guys are off the hook. But we kind of covered it with the top and bottom three. Any final words here on the first book of the Wheel of Time? Yeah, I'd say something that I feel like is more prevalent in the first book that you don't get to see as much are these tiny Easter eggs. So the whole philosophy is the wheel of time. Everything is cyclical. Like these ages happen over and over and over again. And it's alluded to that our reality is part of the wheel of time as well. And so when Tom, the Gleeman, is telling some stories in the two rivers, he mentions stories that are alluding to things that happen in our history. There's one that talks about the the rocket landing on the moon. There's references to royalty in the like 19th, 20th century. Lots of things like that where there's similarities to our history. And it's kind of this fine line of, is he just inspired by that and writing his own version? Or is it literally supposed to be the same story? But because time has passed, so much time has passed, that you know, the story gets diluted and, and changed over time in this whole cyclical nature. Has Jordan come out and said that it was earth or no i feel like i feel like i remember reading it somewhere that that he has said it was earth but i'm not sure i don't think he said it's earth but like he's definitely confirmed that those stories are are referencing stories from our history randland is not earth we're, we're gonna stick with that well, i don't know if, i mean i guess 
going along with that, it would be part of the same world. Yeah. And to, to clarify there, he never actually gives a name to the world that Wheel of Time takes place in. So fans call it Randland. Really, a really original name. <laughs> um, Jake, I did not realize that some of Tom's stories were, were referencing potential Earth events. And now that you tell me that, I love that. And I feel like I need to go back and reread. Because if you listen to the Witcher episode, you'll know that I really like Easter eggs if they're deep cuts. Yeah, there, there's some pretty hard deep cuts. I didn't really, I don't think I caught them at all until like probably a couple years ago when I was reading it again. And I only caught like one of them. And then I was like, wait, is this what it's talking about? And when I looked it up, I found a list of a lot of them that I didn't catch, but other people had. See if I can pull some up right now. Yeah, so in, in book one, some references are to it says tell us about Len, how he flew to the moon in the belly of an eagle made of fire, and about his daughter Salia walking among the stars. And John Glenn was uh, is the name of an astronaut, and Sally Ride as well. And the eagle is the rocket. It says uh, they talk about Elsbeth, Queen of All, would be Queen Elizabeth. Anne Law, the wise counselor, would be Anne Landers, and Matt Teresa, the healer, Mother Teresa. And there are more as the series goes on, but those are the the main ones. Wow, very cool. I feel like I'm reading the book of Revelations right now. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's something I really like. It'd be cool to see how the, the show will incorporate things like that. Okay, thanks, guys. So this was educational for me. I learned something new about a series that I love. Thank you, Jake, our resident expert, for enlightening me. And thanks, Ben, for joining and providing us with your more recent perspective on the series that some of us disagreed with. <laughs> and, you know, I was actually thinking about this throughout. If there's somebody out there that's reading the series for the first time, it would be cool to to do kind of like get your hot takes as you're reading it for the first time. So come on Discord and and tell us what you're, you know, we'll create like a channel for each book so we won't spoil anything. But but come on Discord and tell us about it and and kind of how you perceive the series in the midst of reading it for the first time. Yeah, we are purposely doing our best in these book reviews, at least, to not have any series-long spoilers. I think as we get closer to the TV show coming out, we'll do more broad strokes discussions of the series that might have series-wide spoilers. But book reviews, know that you're going to be safe from any spoilers happening later in the series, right? Yeah, right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe out there. Watch out for COVID-19. But the good news is podcasts do not transmit disease. I believe that the World Health Organization has confirmed that. Yes, they put out an official statement about it, actually. Yeah, this episode is sponsored by the CDC. So <laughs> Hopefully we are still able to joke about this in two weeks. <laughs> we'll see how the wheel The wheel wills, weaves, as they yeah, say. It's, it's currently weaving some. The wheel wills as the, <laughs> yeah. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. I don't know how they're going to yeah, pull that off. That's only something you can write. Sad. <laughs> Fantastic. Until next time, thank you for listening to another episode of Phantology Podcast, and we will see you later.